Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Dimaduck. Uh, I'm a HBase committer and a uh, member of uh, the HBase team at Hortonworks. I'd like to talk to you this afternoon about HBase and HBase latency. So uh, this is a talk that uh, I prepared in collaboration with my colleague uh, Nicolas Lechamp from Scaled Risk, but uh, unfortunately he wasn't able to make it to the conference in the end. So I will be doing my best to honor his portion of the talk and I will be presenting solo. So uh, I'm going to assume some familiarity with HBase. I hope that's okay. This is a Hadoop summit, Hadoop conference, but uh, uh, it's about HBase in particular. Um, <coughs> so HBase is a read-write, random read-write database. And of course, uh, so for a system like this, uh, latency is an important uh, con uh, consideration. So I want to talk about what does latency mean in HBase. Uh, latency means different things to different folks, right? So I want to clarify that a little bit. And then I want to go through the sources of, of latency uh, along the read path, the write path. And then for those of us that are interested in really making improvements uh, in the performance of the system, I'm going to talk about some of the future work, next steps that uh, we should be engaging uh, as a community. Okay? So uh, what is latency? Some folks, uh, high-frequency traders, these kinds of people talk about nanoseconds, microseconds. For other people, uh, low latency is uh, sufficient if uh, you, know, you have a user sitting at a, at a keyboard and the response is in an interactive session. So um, in terms of uh, HBase world, we're looking at uh, milliseconds is what our kind of latency uh, world looks like. Um, and so when we're looking at latency, when we're evaluating the latency of a system, we talk about latency not as a single number but in percentiles, right? So the behavior of a system at the 50th percentile can be uh, quite nice, but uh, that same system can have a very uh, poor performance at a higher percentile, 95, 99 percentiles. Um, usually there's a, a full order of magnitude or more difference between what you see at that uh, kind of average or, or middle uh, of the, the uh, percentile line and, and what you see at the upper end. Beyond 99 percentile is uh, kind of scary. That's, in this world, that's sort of where there'd be dragons. You look at the, the academic research uh, around system latency, they talk about actually the term nine, magical 1% uh, is, is in the literature. Um, especially at the microsecond uh, resolution, uh, when you're looking at the 99th percentile in microseconds, there's a lot of things that can, that can be impacting you there. So I'll talk about a little bit what some of those things look like. Uh, so how do we measure latency with HBase? So there's uh, two tools at our disposal. Uh, one is the YCSB. This tool is pretty well known. Uh, but there's another tool, with one that ships with HBase. This is the performance evaluation tool. I personally, I like the second one better uh, because it's more HBase sp specific. It allows me to play with the different knobs that HBase provides so you can see how the different features impact the latency of your system. Uh, it also reports latency in microseconds. Higher uh, granularity can be helpful. And uh, finally, we can look at more than just the 99 percentile. So if I want to look at three nines, four nines, even five nines, I can do that uh, sort of analysis with the performance evaluation tool. Uh, <coughs> so for the write path, there's basically two kinds of writes that we're interested with HBase. There's a single operation, a single put. Uh, this is a scenario where a uh, client connects to a region server. It sends uh, a bit of data to the region server. The region server receives the request. It persists the data. It makes it durable. It stores it. It's a strongly consistent system, so that's a, a necessary piece of the, the operation. And then it sends a response, an acknowledgment to the client that the write has indeed, indeed been received. Uh, and you can send a single write at a time or multiple writes at a time like this, and this is generally the behavior. Uh, as of HBase 96, there's a new functionality on the multi-write side. Uh, we call it streaming writes. Uh, with this implementation now, writes are happening asynchronously. Uh, so a client is batching up writes, it's sending them to the appropriate region server, and then uh, uh, flushing the next set of writes from the buffer to the next region server. And this has a, a, had a, a very nice impact on uh, on the performance, the right performance of, of the system. I'll talk about it in more detail in a, in a, uh, further down the, the road here. Uh, 
Uh, but when we're looking at, at the system, there's basically four scenarios in which we're talking about interested in latency. The startup scenario is maybe not that interesting most of the time, uh, but then there's the kind of steady operating state, and then uh, what happens when the system is under load, when it's overloaded, and then of course what happens uh, during failure scenarios, right? This is Hadoop, we're assuming redundant systems and uh, failure is an uh, assumed, acknowledged uh, part of our reality. So we'll look at what happens there as well. Uh, so the single put uh, that I was just kind of over uh, describing in the overview, uh, the client has to connect to a region server. So of course that's a TCP connection. If a client has multiple uh, threads operating, uh, working with that same server, they're going to be sharing that connection. And of course, uh, anytime you have sharing a multi-threaded uh, system, you've got to manage the coordination of, of that interaction. So you have things like uh, queues and, and threads and locks and so forth. Uh, same kind of scenario on the server. Uh, it's actually amplified, right? Because the single, uh, in, any given server is talking to potentially multiple clients. It's receiving requests from all of those clients simultaneously, so it has to receive them, schedule them, and uh, dispatch them fairly. So again, we have uh, queues, we have buffers, we have locks, and this sort of thing that all impact our latency. <clears throat> so what's actually happening under the hood, right? The, the, when a, the region server receives the write request, uh, it has to uh, take that write, it queues it up for writing to the wall, the wall is uh, flush, there's an HDFS flush, so that uh, the client is going to the data nodes involved and it's saying, all right, did you receive the right? Yes, did you receive the right? right. It's a strongly consistent system and this is uh, part of the guarantee, part of the, part of the deal here. And then it also has to put that right into the mem store. So when the right is going to the wall, there's actually a single wall for the region server that's shared by all the regions. So again, we have uh, multiple threads that are all interacting with this thing. They all are sending writes so to this shared uh, resource. So again, there's queues involved. So you uh, send the, the write to the wall and it's, the work is queued up and then uh, when it's executed, you get the response back. Sometimes you're lucky and another thread has already performed the sync on your behalf. So in your particular case, your particular uh, thread, there's nothing to do. Other times you're less lucky you are end up syncing the data for multiple other requests that have come in. And so you can see some variance here. But for the, in terms of latency for a single put, these are some real world numbers looking at a kilobyte of data. Uh, older cluster, smaller cluster doing single put at a time, you know, put, 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 put. And uh, here you see uh, the mean latency is around uh, one millisecond. Uh, with a 99 percentile, that's roughly twice that. And uh, so uh, this is the kind of thing that you can expect out of a uh, uh, cluster. Again, a little bit older hardware, so maybe better with more modern stuff. <clears throat> so where is, what is being done in that one to two millisecond time window, clock on the wall time? What's actually happening? What are the sources of latency here? So one candidate is the network, right? This is a distributed system. Uh, one machine is talking to another, so uh, you've got to send packets over the network. So. Within a data center, um, networks are quite fast, uh, half a millisecond for a packet round trip, perhaps much less. Uh, these are some measurements of the uh, TCP round trip on that same cluster. And you see here that the, the 50 percentile range, we're looking at a tenth of a millisecond. So not a lot of time is being spent on the network actually here. But also notice that the delta between 50 percent and 99 percentile is now 5x, not just twice. So there's uh, quite a bit more variance for the network piece than uh, what we saw overall. That uh, write, that, that flush of the wall to, uh, in H to HDFS was kind of scary. So what does that look like? So again, the same cluster, let's look at just the flush, that same data in isolation. And here, what do we see? Uh, on the 50 percentile, a quarter of a millisecond, not too, too bad. And here again, the 99 percentile is on the order of 5x of, uh, uh, the mean. So overall, this is uh, pretty acceptable in our in our millisecond kind of kind of world. And this is on HDFS uh, 2.4, I believe. So where else is the latency going? Is the time going? Um, then, because we're talking about milliseconds here, there's actually plenty of places we can uh, see hiccups and jitters. Right, uh, dif differences in different uh, JVM implementations. Uh, you see. 
issues in the network. Uh, that was kind of a, a simple case, but you can have uh, complex network failures, OS schedulers, all of these things will impact you when you're talking about a uh, millisecond of response time, right? Uh, so for one example, uh, we see a much better uh, performance from a uh, JVM uh, 1.7 versus 1.6 in its implementation of blocking queues. Uh, if perhaps you failed to configure the Nagle algorithm properly in your cluster, you're gonna see 40 millisecond pauses uh, just out of the gate. Uh, older Linux kernel implementations have bugs in their schedulers that can cause delays on the order of 50 milliseconds, right? Uh, and of course, there's a file system and there's lots of literature about uh, performance and implementation of file systems. So what about HBase itself? Uh, the design of the system, it's managing shards of the, of the cluster for you. So part of that management is splitting and balancing, moving regions uh, around, and all of this is going to have an impact on your latency, right? Uh, splits uh, are a, a naturally occurring thing. Uh, these can impact uh, your latency with uh, seconds. Um, balancing moving regions is uh, a little bit uh, less costly, but at the very minimum, you're gonna have uh, client retries, and those are adding hundreds of milliseconds uh, to, to the, the latency of any individual request. This is an improvement over the 94 scenario where our retries were on the orders of seconds, uh, so you can look for that uh, faster uh, uh, during balances on, on 96. And then, of course, there's garbage collection, which uh, in the HBase community is kind of a one of those devils that people just sort of chuckle about and it's a little bit scared. Uh, I'm gonna talk about garbage collection a little bit more on the right, uh, sorry, on the read path. It has more of an impact there, but uh, even once you've properly tuned your garbage collector and you've got a, a healthy uh, provision cluster, you're, you're not over capacity and you're running at, a, at a, a healthy state, you can still expect to see pauses on the order of tens of milliseconds uh, because of garbage collection. So this is sort of standard operation, uh, operation of the cluster. Now we start adding more and more clients, more and more load. Uh, as I, I said, there's concurrency happening. Uh, and so concurrency is really a factor of how many cores you have available, how many spindles do you have, how many disks, um, how often are you talking to remote machines and how local are they on the network. All of these things uh, are going to, to impact you and it's very difficult to quantify how all of these things interact with each other. HBase gives you a couple knobs for handling this thing, notably the, the handler count, uh, but uh, realistically this is kind of difficult to, to estimate on. But all of those uh, concurrent operations are, again, they're involved in queues and, and queues have locks and so we end up uh, adding, uh, you know, on the order of millisecond in terms of delays from this sort of thing. Uh, one way to counteract this, uh, new in 98, is the uh, resource scheduler. So uh, this is giving us a way to give priority to certain RPC requests over others. And so you can, for critical uh, latency critical paths, you can sort of mitigate some of these issues. But uh, it's not really very easily uh, accessible right now. Uh, there's work in progress that will make this uh, more of a configurable kind of feature. You could write your own code if you wanted to today, uh, but hopefully in the future this will be easier to use and take advantage of. Uh, so we've gone from a healthy operating loaded cluster now to overloaded. So now HBase's contract and its uh, goals have shifted a little bit from uh, handling all the concurrency and, and accepting all the rights to now, uh, oh, please don't blow up. Keep the cluster alive and running and healthy and happy. And so the primary way that HBase tries to manage this is to uh, no longer accept requests. So have you got too many H files? Your compactions aren't keeping up. What's the solution to that thing? Well, let's stop accepting writes. Let's let the compaction uh, queue uh, eke down a little bit better. Uh, too many wall files, you need to, to be rolling the log. Well, what's going on? Well, we, we stop accepting writes again, and we, uh, uh, we wait to let the system catch up again. So uh, this is uh, not a hard real-time system, right? Which means there's no strong guarantees around how long any of these operations will take. Of course, there's also machine failure, and failure involved in HBase and is a, basically a three-step process. You have to, the cluster has to realize that a machine has failed. It has to reassign the responsibility of the regions from that region, the failed region server to others in the cluster, and then it needs to replay the, law, the wall files, uh, any outstanding edits, 
uh, to maintain that strong consistency. For the right path, uh, wall replay is not a critical in the critical path, so we can basically skip that. So uh, recovery from a clean crash is relatively quick on uh, the right side. Uh, we're talking on the order of seconds. Um, if a machine hangs or freezes or becomes slow, this is a little bit more difficult. Uh, you have to detect that the machine is, is not very healthy, and you're balancing basically between uh, five to 15 second pause, depending on your configuration, how long you're willing to wait before you say oh, that machine's actually dead. You need to uh, juggle this with uh, how long you're willing to wait for any given garbage collection action. If you've got a long GC, you don't want that pause to then cause the cluster to think the machine is dead. So this is a, a, a little bit of a, a, a gentle thing to, to configure properly. But overall, the main, uh, latency on a single put is quite good. We're talking about milliseconds, although spikes do happen due to these different operational uh, events. However, those are relatively rare, and so uh, we see the uh, 99 percentile numbers that, that uh, I was demonstrating earlier. So I mentioned new in 96, we have this functionality we're calling streaming puts. This is where we're buffering writes on the client side and sending them to the different region servers as they're available. So it's happening asynchronously in the background uh, from the client. So the main benefit, a uh, little bit of smarts on the client side, the benefit here is that now you've decoupled the latency uh, of the system from any individual region server, right? If a single region server is being slow, the client has other threads that it's sending to the other region servers that it can be writing data to. And so you kind of smooth over those spikes in the, the latency uh, there. There's a couple uh, configuration parameters uh, to tune if you are interested. Uh, by default, we're a little bit conservative, but if so, if you have a more aggressive, you want to have a more aggressive client, uh, maybe a larger cluster, you can tweak uh, these, some of these parameters. Uh, but the, the net benefit of this uh, streaming put approach is quite good. Uh, taking the standard YCSB benchmark with a empty table, single region, uh, and populating that table, we see a 50% aggregate throughput increase uh, by using streaming puts because, again, you're not waiting on the, the uh, individual uh, region server uh, or region to, to respond to you here. So overall, writes can be very fast, uh, but it's not a real hard time, uh, hard real-time system. Uh, there are spikes, there are delays, and uh, failure in HBase writes is actually not so bad. Uh, HBase handles this pretty well. Okay, so that's the write side. Now let's talk through the read side. So again, we're looking at uh, small amounts of data here, right? Uh, either a git of a single row uh, or maybe short scans. And uh, just like on the right side, we have two APIs we can use to uh, retrieve data from HBase. We've got a single git where you're making a single request, or you, there's the multi-git where you have a single RPC uh, retrieving multiple pieces of data. There's no streaming uh, read on HBase. Uh, we have to actually retrieve the data uh, and to maintain our uh, synchronous client, there's no way to uh, stream the results the way that we can do on the right, so uh, we don't have that nice API. Um, and just like on the right side, there's the same four stages, uh, startup, cost of the same, steady state, overloaded, and then failure, of course. So from the client perspective uh, with the multi-git, what we're doing is uh, pretty similar, right? You group the gits according to the region server that's hosting the regions in question. You ship those uh, requests across the network and to the region servers that are responsible for the data you're looking for. Those can be happening in parallel, so you're really, in terms of clock on the wall time, you're paying the network cost more or less once. Um, <clears throat> and then when the region server receives it, it uh, the request, it's issuing git, 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 and then uh, sending the results back. So uh, the network uh, involvement here means uh, for this part of the git path, we're looking at you know, tens of, of microseconds. It's not, uh, not a huge component here. On the server side, it's actually a fair bit more complicated. I don't want to dive deep into all of the, the details of this complexity that's been covered in, in other places. I do want to go through some of the reasons for this complexity and, and what HBase is doing here. It's all based around a, a single very important uh, point, which is that uh, disk seek takes on the order of uh, five orders of magnitude longer than in-memory access. So the entire goal of all that complexity you just saw is to avoid going to disk as much as possible. 
So if that's the aim, how do we do that? Uh, there's a couple approaches, a couple tricks we have up our sleeves for avoiding going to disk. Um, the first one is, is through metadata. I call, call this uh, candidate H-file elimination. So you've been writing data to HBase. You're uh, going to make some query against it. You've got multiple H-files that have been flushed that you need to, that are all potential candidates for containing that data. But you know a little bit about those files uh, before you even look at them. So we have metadata that's available about those files that's cheap to access. So we can look at the incoming requests. Uh, we have these parameters, the start key, the end key, any kind of time range uh, restrictions that are on those requests. And we can look at the range of data that's stored in those H files. And we can say, for this particular request, uh, this given file contains no data that we're interested in. So throw it out. It's, it's not a candidate. The other trick we have that works by the same basic principle are Bloom filters. So Bloom filters are a persisted data structure that we store in line with the data blocks inside of the H files. And they store uh, a representation of that data, and we can use that representation and the query to dis determine whether a file actually contains, uh, we know for sure whether the file contains none, uh, no relevant data to the request, as negative, if we get that correct. Um, so again, we can look at the Bloom filters and we can uh, no, for a file, it does not contain any data relevant to our, our request. We can exclude it, and uh, we can hopefully then take uh, what might be a candidate set of, of uh, 10 or 7 or 10 files and reduce that, that set down to maybe uh, 2 or 3, 3 to 5, something like this. And so fewer files means uh, fewer files we have to look in, which means fewer seeks, which means better performance. Uh, Bloom filters, I'll also add, have been in HBase for quite a while. I don't know how long exactly. We've turned them on now in, in 96, so you'll be, by default, you'll be enjoying this, this functionality. <coughs> so once you have the candidate H files, what HBase needs to do is go and look in all of those files for key values that match the query that's been requested. So uh, what it's doing is pulling data from each of those files, it's seeking through those files to get the next key value, and then it's doing a merge sort uh, across the files to produce the final view. So how can we make this go faster? One thing we can do is execute those seeks in parallel. So if the data has been striped across all the spindles in the machine, then that parallelism can actually happen and we can pay that seek cost, again, clock on the wall time just once, even though we're seeking multiple files, multiple spindles all simultaneously through the parallel seek. Uh, another trick we have is the short circuit reads. Hopefully you've configured this, uh, enabled short circuit reads on your cluster. This way, the region server process itself can interact with the files. It doesn't have to broker that interaction through the, the data node. And, uh, and so uh, there's one less hop, and, and that reduces the latency involved as well. And then, of course, there's block locality. This is Hadoop, and so we're all very familiar with uh, what block locality or what, sorry, what data locality means in terms of uh, data access. So HBase is no different than that. A uh, region server that's accessing data on its local disks is not uh, is going to be faster than if it has to go to the network to ask its neighbor for that disk. So um, this is a, a reason why compactions are very helpful is they're rewriting data. That data is being rewritten, a copy is being local, and so you'll have block locality. But of course, we are trying to avoid going to disk unless we absolutely have to. So uh, what else can we do? Uh, HBase has a component uh, called the block cache. So that data that's stored in H files, it's organized into uh, sections, segments of data, we call those blocks. So every time you go to disk to retrieve a, a bit of data, uh, we use that block, we read that block from disk, and then we use it to service the request. We also keep that block around in memory in the block cache so that subsequent requests uh, have uh, a chance to hit the cache instead of going back to disk. Uh, so how often are we going to be using that cache is, we're talking about our cache hit rate, right? And uh, there's a couple ways to influence then maximize that cache hit rate. One of them is to just have more memory. How much uh, cache can we have? Keep more blocks up in memory, and that's going to increase our chances of, of having a cache hit. Another uh, technique is actually more about the application design and the schema design than about HBase itself, and that's uh, access locality. So when I think about access locality, I'm thinking about two different things. One is temporal access locality. So am I hitting the same? Uh, due to the, my application pathways, are they accessing the same uh, piece of data uh, within the, the same time window? If that's the case, then it's very likely that that block will already be resident in the cache because it's already been read recently, and so your, your request uh, responses will be fast. 
The other is physical access locality. So let's say I'm not accessing exactly the same data, but I'm accessing adjacent data. HBase uh, gives you control over the, the arrangement of data, so uh, data locality is also is already part of your schema design. So let's say you're accessing row, uh, uh, row B, uh, and then the next access you want to hit is, say, row C. Hopefully those, those two rows are close together, they're stored close together, and so hopefully they're in the same block, and you won't have to go to disk to, hit, uh, to serve that, uh, that consecutive read. Uh, a little more detail on the block cache. Uh, I've, I've done some work to try to expose this part of the system. Uh, so there's uh, some blog posts uh, up there you can check out if you want to know more detail. HBase ships two different uh, block cache, uh, it ships a number of block cache implementations. The default one is this LRU block cache. Um, it's a uh, LRU least recently used, so this is the eviction policy it's, it's describing here. Uh, this implementation is really quite good for most use cases. Uh, it's fast and it's uh, well managed and it, be it behaves quite well up to a certain point. So that certain point tends to be uh, the amount of data that you want to be caching. Uh, so the, the a particular detail of this implementation is that it's managed by the uh, on heap memory. So the, the JVM's garbage collector is responsible for handling those block evictions when they happen. And so this can increase and cause more garbage collection activity, which can cause uh, uh, process pauses, which can cause issues in terms of the availability of the system. But if you don't have uh, gobs and gobs of memory, and if you're okay with keeping your, your focus on maybe more like the 95 percentile than on 99 or three nines, then, then I say go ahead and, and keep using the block cache that, that's already there by default. If, however, you have far more memory uh, that you wanna take advantage of, or you're really interested in pushing the envelope here, then uh, you need to, to look at one of the alternatives. And the one that I like the most here is the bucket cache. Uh, it has a couple different operating modes, but uh, one of those is off heap, which means that it's storing this data and it's managing this, da uh, this data in memory that's not managed by the garbage collector. So uh, it's taking that into its own destiny, and that has some nice uh, side effects. One is that uh, it's not impacting the garbage collector uh, and the garbage collection performance that has to be done. And it's also allowing us to take advantage of far more than the, the garbage collector, far more RAM than the garbage collector would have, would have allowed. So let's talk a little bit more about garbage collection. It's an it's a, uh, inherent uh, aspect of running on the JVM, right? Uh, we get a lot of benefit uh, as application developers from having managed memory, uh, but there are also some side effects as well. Uh, so you, we talk about garbage collector uh, tuning uh, a little bit in HBase. Um, one of the details, without getting into too much depth about the different garbage collection implementations, uh, there's a couple things that are helpful to know about uh, memory management on the JVM. One is uh, that you have an effective, uh, if you're concerned about, again, concerned about performance, you have an effective upper bound of about 30 gigabytes. That's due to implementation details of how uh, garbage collection memory management is implemented on the JVM. Uh, the other detail is that the amount of time you will spend in a garbage collection pause is directly correlated to the amount of memory under management. So if you have 30 gigabytes of memory under uh, management by the garbage collector, then your pauses are gonna be longer than if you have only four gigabytes of memory. So if you're concerned about those nines and you're concerned about latency, then I'd say keep the amount of heap you configure for your region servers much lower, uh, eight gigabytes even, and then take more advantage of that off heap block cache uh, for these things. Uh, so uh, even then, uh, you, there is garbage generated through the standard operation of the process, and so collections happen and, and, and pauses can happen. I think we can do a better job in terms of uh, the implementation details of HBase to generate less garbage, uh, but that's uh, sort of future work. So you can expect still to see pauses on the order of, of uh, tens to hundreds of milliseconds. Mil hundreds is on, on more on the, the worst case. Uh, and the other time when you're going to see garbage collection uh, really start to spike uh, on your region servers is when your systems are overloaded. This is a, a kind of a canary to tell you that you've under-provisioned your, your cluster, you don't have enough uh, resources available, you, so the, the resources, the machines you do have are spending a lot of time churning through data, churning through memory, and uh, uh, spending CPU cycles in garbage collection. So. 
if garbage collection really is uh, such a problem for our low latency world, why don't we just try to off heap all of the things, right? And that's, I think, a legitimate question. Uh, we have uh, this uh, off heap bucket cache, which is pretty nice. Uh, we can do more, uh, perhaps off heaping the mem store and other parts of the data processing, uh, data flow pipeline, our interaction with network interfaces, our interaction with HDFS. All of these are potential places where we could uh, use off heap managed, uh, unmanaged memory instead of uh, mem memory on the JVM. So uh, there's some tickets open, work in progress to uh, see this done. Um, HBase has been around for a little while, right? There's, there's uh, hundreds of, of person hours invested into this project, which means that there's a lot of uh, code there. And so this is a fundamental change to a system that is uh, fairly mature, a code base that's fairly mature. So making a change like this uh, requires a lot of plumbing. So it's a, it's a, a lot of work to do to even just experiment to see how well this will, will benefit. <clears throat> so the other latency enemy here uh, for in the land of HBase is compactions. Uh, compactions are healthy uh, for the, the read path in particular, right? Because we've reduced the number of candidate files and the number of files that we have to seek through to be able to service a, re a read when we compact. Uh, but there's some downsides. Uh, we talk often about the IO resources that are consumed. Your compactions are contending with your other uh, online data operations for those precious IO resources. But compactions are doing some other things, have other impact on the system as well, uh, uh, largely around the block cache. So every time we uh, compact files, those old files are no longer relevant, and we have to evict uh, the blocks from those files. So we're evicting the data blocks, uh, data that you've already read, right? You spend those precious milliseconds to read those blocks and cache them. We have to throw that away. The index blocks uh, that we're using to find the data blocks, the, the bloom blocks that we're using, all that stuff has to be reread again when compactions happen. So this seems uh, pretty terrible, right? Uh, but there is, uh, we have one trick up our sleeve to, to help mitigate this problem, and that's the OS buffer cache. So uh, when writes are coming in, uh, the Linux kernel is keeping the, the freshly written data uh, resident in memory, and we can take advantage of that. So if you have a cluster that's servicing uh, mixed workload reads and writes, you can do yourself a favor by not consuming all of your memory with the JVM processes, so the region server and so on. I'll, uh, leave some of that memory, set it aside for the, the Linux kernel, and the, the OS buffer will, will help mitigate the cost of those compactions that are happening. Read side failure, uh, it's a little bit worse than on the right side because we do have that, that wall replay that we have to deal with. Uh, that's necessary for maintaining the strong consistency guarantees of the system. Uh, detection, uh, assignment, replay, all of that is, is still the same. Uh, the other issue with, with machine failure here is that your locality drops to zero, right? It's very likely uh, uh, that, especially on a larger cluster, that the data that, that uh, the region server that has been assigned responsibility for the regions, the data from those regions is quite likely not local because it has never compacted that data before. So you've got zero data locality. It's making network requests to retrieve data to service those reads. And also, of course, the block cache is empty. So it doesn't know anything about the recent access patterns that the other region server was seeing for the region in question. So you've got to be populating that block cache uh, up again from zero. And uh, just like on the right side, uh, failures in binary, uh, you've got uh, machines that are slowing and dying, and we have a couple uh, interesting ways to mitigate these problems, these kinds of problems on the, the read path. Uh, one is down at the HDFS layer. Uh, 2.4 introduced this uh, hedged reads, read functionality. Um, the idea here is that uh, the HBase, uh, cli uh, HDFS client can communicate with multiple data nodes, and whichever one responds fastest with the data that's requested, it will use that. Um, we haven't experimented too much with this in HBase. It's uh, uh, still a relatively new feature uh, from HDFS. The other is timeline consistency. The, I'm not going to talk about this one in, in great detail. It's already been covered in, in another talk. Uh, but the idea here is, is very much the same, except it's on the HBase level. Though. So the client says, I, I can retrieve this data from these candidate region servers. Whichever one replies fastest is the one that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use. So the net effect is you don't have to wait around for a slow machine. So to summarize the read path, uh, latency on the read path is heavily dominated by your cache hit ratio. And there's a couple ways to mitigate, uh, to, to maximize that. Uh, but really, it comes down to what are you doing uh, to maximize your cache hits. And of course, uh, we're talking about millisecond latency here. So sometimes that uh, jitter effect, especially when we're talking about 99 percentiles, that jitter is 
is going to dominate. So <clears throat> to kind of summarize, uh, summarize the concepts here, uh, this is uh, we present as kind of a contract for HBase. So assuming you've well provisioned your system, you're not overloading your system, your application, uh, your schema is well designed, these are the kinds of, of response times that HBase uh, can give to your application. These are the kind of guarantees we're willing to make. Steady state is milliseconds across the board, and then failures in, in different scenarios based on the details. But uh, So I will assert that uh, if you're seeing performance worse than this uh, on terms of your latency, then it's an HBase problem, uh, not your problem. Again, assuming that uh, you're doing your end of the bargain of, of, of proper uh, schema design and, and provisioning and so forth. Uh, so everything here we've talked about has been looking at that 99 percentile. Uh, so what are the things, what other things can we do? Uh, kind of summarize that. So uh, I talked a little bit about off heap, uh, going off heap and, and uh, generating less garbage using fewer objects to service the same path. Uh, this will reduce the amount of overhead that, that GC is imposing on the system. Uh, another interesting feature, I think, uh, is the using compressed block cache. So Right now, when we read data off of disk, we decompress it before we're caching it in memory. We could take much uh, better, better advantage of that memory, have an effectively much larger block cache if we kept those blocks compressed. So that's a, a very interesting feature I, I'm, I'm keen to see through. And then uh, on the H, uh, HDFS side, we could have a better contract in terms of block locality. And uh, so that's where preferred location uh, APIs would be helpful uh, for us. HBase can kind of manage its own destiny better in terms of where blocks are placed on the file system and uh, it can make better decisions when recovering region servers. And then finally, there's that last magical uh, 1%. Uh, if we really want to see uh, better latency numbers, uh, eke out better performance, I think we need to dive in and, and dig deeper into what is going on there and, and really try to, to tune that part of our world better. And then uh, uh, hopefully we'll see better results on those lower metrics uh, by making improvements there at the, the top end. So that's everything we prepared for you. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the talk and learned a thing or two. Uh, I can take some questions. It looks like I have a couple minutes left. So the question is about uh, SSDs and the read path in particular. Uh, any specific parameters? I haven't personally experimented with this uh, very much yet. Uh, uh, there's a couple places where you can use SSDs. Uh, SSDs are still expensive in terms of data density, right? So if you're talking about uh, tens of terabytes, hundreds of terabytes, uh, petabytes under management, you probably don't want to use SSDs for those. But for instance, uh, you can use the bucket cache to, uh, in combination with SSD, to have a, a much, much larger uh, block cache, effective block cache, by putting part of that on the SSD instead of uh, keeping it only in memory. Yeah. So the question is about the value of the block cache versus just depending entirely on the buffer cache. Uh, I haven't experimented with that directly, but uh, those who came before me have. And uh, in particular, there was another block cache implementation called the slab cache, which I didn't mention at all here. Uh, but during the development process of that cache, uh, those developers looked at that and they saw that by allowing HBase to manage its own destiny in terms of the, that memory, uh, that they were seeing, I believe it was on the order of a 5x uh, improvement uh, by using uh, the block cache instead of depending. And, and that's because there's other processes on the system, right? HBase doesn't control what the kernel is putting into that, that buffer cache. So I think that's the primary reason why. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the question is about uh, configuration for Zookeeper and how, how that can have so Zookeeper is not involved at all in the, the read and write path, right? It's only in that, that failure recovery kind of scenarios where, uh, excuse me, where Zookeeper comes into play. 
Uh, so that's not an uh, aspect of this uh, that I've looked at very closely yet. I'm more concerned about the steady state operations. Uh, I know uh, a lot of work has been done in MTTR, and part of the configuration is, is uh, uh, how long of a heartbeat are you willing to, to wait between uh, as part of your detection scenario, right? So um, uh, if you've got your, your garbage collection uh, minimized, and you're not expecting long garbage collection pauses, then you can be more aggressive on the, the timeout, uh, zookeeper uh, timeout, and, and thus be more aggressive about initiating uh, recovery sooner. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any more hands, so thank you very much, everyone.